Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Hello one and all, welcome into another episode of Stories. I'm Steve Gilley along with Rod Mullins and today Rod we're going to be talking about a very famous person out of Wise County, Virginia by the name of Francis Gary Powers. Yeah, and you know, Steve, the interesting thing about this, I've been told by a lot of uh, people, including, uh, you know, in-laws and different people from around the Pound area, that, you know, there were two times the United States came on the verge of entering World War III. One was during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which happened uh, in 1962 with uh, President John F. Kennedy. And last but not least, back in 1960, when Francis Gary Powers was shot down over Russia on Operation Overflight, as it was called. That's right. Now, Mr. Powers was born in Jenkins, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. He was born August 17, 1929. Right. He was born to Oliver and Ida Powers. Uh, Oliver was a coal miner at one time, and then he later moved on and became a shoe repairman and used to have a store located on the main part of Park Avenue in downtown Norton. Yeah, that's right. Gary Powers was commissioned a second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force in 1950. Like many young mountain men, he wanted to get out of the mountains and go out and um, make his way with the U.S. military. He was discharged as a captain in 1956. Uh, He was an F-84 Thunderjet pilot out of Turner Air Force Base in Georgia, but he didn't fly combat missions in Korea. And why was that, Rod? Because the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, recruited him to fly aerial reconnaissance missions and that was a big thing especially in the cold war following Mm -hmm. world war ii when the soviets were building up and everything was happening especially over into europe and uh things were divided off as the soviets began to make their move into former german occupied areas uh it became necessary at that point that reconnaissance and aerial reconnaissance was a big thing throw a note in there steve also my dad used to my dad was in the air force he worked on rb 47s during that time and rb 47s were reconnaissance based bomber 47 models and they were built and my dad worked on those engines and he also flew on one of those planes as well and uh they were based simply in reconnaissance they went up they took pictures they took pictures at certain uh, altitudes but there was one thing that francis gary powers was a part of in 1956 that the united states air force probably knew about but they didn't have a plane that could fly that high because the CIA commissioned this through Lockheed, and it was the U-2 reconnaissance or the U-2 program, as Clarence Kelly, who was the head of the CIA, named it at that time. That's right. Now, now these planes were something else, Rod. I mean, they could fly over 70,000 feet. Yeah, they flew over 70,000 feet, and you didn't dress out in a normal pilot uniform. Uh -uh. You didn't have the normal mask or anything else. You were pretty much in an astronaut suit. You were in a pressurized suit that kind of held everything together because you were getting up to where there's very little air starting to get up through there. I mean, you've got air, but, you know, the pressure on you is a lot, and then you're having to breathe through almost what is, it looked like an old, version of an astronaut's helmet, but it was a full glass uh, version of a helmet. Matter of fact, that uh, helmet of Francis Gary Powers, or at least a uh, facsimile, uh, exists today in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. That's right. Well, the reason they flew that high was because they thought that the uh, Russian missiles couldn't fly that high, and they figured that the pilots were safe up there taking their photographs. There had been a few of the U-2 flights over the Soviet Union, and he flights in around a certain bases and come right back out, mainly from Pakistan, mm-hmm. which at that time was one of our allies. They took shots of military installations, other important sites. I think one of the places they went to actually take photographs was the Soviet space base, mm-hmm. from which they launched their satellites. City. Yeah. Well, on May 1st, 1960... Uh, there was a plan for the first complete overflight mission, and Francis Gary Powers was assigned to fly that plane. He left the military air base in Peshawar, Pakistan. His flight plan was to take him to Bodo, Norway. Well, he was in flight for about four hours, and believe it or not, he was shot down over Sverdlovsk. Mm-hmm. Uh, the blast shot off a wing, and the uh, 
put the plane into an uncontrollable spin. And, you know, a lot of people say, why didn't he just destroy the plane or, you know, do what he could? But he was in such a situation, right? He couldn't do anything but try to get loose from the seat and get out. He couldn't even hit the eject button. You know, what's so funny about this, Steve, that you're bringing this up? A lot of people, yeah, have said that same thing. Why didn't he go? Why didn't he destroy the plane? And why couldn't he have ended the whole thing? Well, what was going on at that time was in that uncontrollable spin, he had no other option but to try to eject out of the plane. That was the only thing he could do. And then, uh, as shown in Bridge of Spies, a movie that was released uh, late last year in 2015 with Tom Hanks, they put some things into it that also kind of opened up whether or not it really happened or not. But he did partially eject out of the plane. But what ended up happening, he was stuck on the plane. Yeah. He had actually gotten stuck or was holding on to the plane as he was going down and hoping that everything was going to work out, that he could eventually get away from the plane and then deploy the chute, and be able to land safely. I mean, this was something, this is like one of your worst nightmares. You're there, and you don't know what to do, and you're in a situation of where, what do I do? But if you do something, it could end up killing you, or it could uh, end up uh, saving your life. And this was one of those times of where it was happening so quickly, you didn't know really what decision to make. One or the other was going to either get you killed or was going to save your life. Or or cripple you. I mean, he couldn't eject because it it would cut his legs off on the way out. So he had to basically climb up and get the cockpit open and jump out. But by that point, he could not reach down to get the self-destruct switch. Mm -hmm. And with the plane spinning around, there's no way he could force himself down. And so all he could do is just jump on out and come on down in his parachute. Yeah, and you know you got to think of another thing too. He still had a self-contained uh, unit, a breathing unit, on his uh, mm-hmm. in his suit of what he was using and everything. But you know you could only eject at a or get out of a plane at a certain uh, altitude too, because I mean, hey, you've got to have some air, or at least some kind of wind or something to help you about deploying your chute as you're going down. So all of this was happening so quickly all of it at the same time, and he was just lucky that he got out of it in one piece. That's right. Now, he did end up getting captured by Russian Secret Service once he hit the ground. He was taken to the KGB headquarters and put in Lubyanka prison. Uh, mm-hmm. He did have, and this this is something that people had talked about and wondered about, he had a poison suicide pin that mm-hmm. was hidden inside a silver dollar, he took that dollar, hid it in his clothes in case he needed it. He didn't want to just leave it on the ground in case a child found it and maybe hurt themselves with the pin. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he wanted to make sure that if things got really bad enough, he'd have that pin available for him. Uh, here's the other thing that a lot of people overlook. This happened on May 1st. Mm-hmm. May Day. May Day, which was the biggest holiday and celebration for the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if you remember the movie or not. They have made mention about it, but uh, Lee Majors did a movie back in the mid-70s about Operation Overflight, the U-2 story. Yes. And uh, one of the things that happens is that uh, President Eisenhower was sitting at Camp David at that time, or what we know as Camp David to this day. And the first thing that after they found out that a plane had been shot down over the Soviet Union, the first thing that started going into play was, how are we going to cover this up? How are we going to be able to go and say that, you know, we were spying on the Soviet Union? Well, the excuse came up that it was a weather plane. And then they assumed that in the process, this weather plane had strayed off course and that Francis Gary Powers had been killed in this uh, event of where they had strayed off course. And they weren't really saying that, you know, the Soviets hadn't shot it down or anything, but something unfortunate had happened to this NASA weather plane and this NASA mission. And so what it ended up happening was, after all this, the Soviets and the KGB uh, presented a U-2 plane painted with supposedly fake NASA logos and serial numbers on it. And Khrushchev himself was pretty smart in this. Mm -hmm. He just kept quiet about having captured the pilot and just let the U.S. keep running its mouth Mm -hmm. uh, until they said, hey, guess what we got here? Here's the plane. Here's the pilot. Yep. And And that immediately changed things. That was it. 
Well, when that came out, the local newspaper in Wise County, the Coalfield Progress, scooped every single newspaper, TV, and radio network in the world with the headline, quote, Wise County Boy Believes Shot Down Over Russia, end quote. Mm. Now, as a result of this shutdown, as, as you probably already know, folks, uh, it destroyed a major peace summit in Paris, led to, to the withdrawal of an invitation for President Eisenhower to visit Moscow because Khrushchev had visited the U.S. the year before to great acclaim, made a great impression, and set back peace between the two countries by quite a few years. Mm -hmm. Powers was interrogated for months at Lubyanka Prison by the KGB. He did eventually make a full confession and a public apology for his part in the espionage. Well, you know, and what was interesting, too, Francis Gary Powers' his father, Oliver, with the help of Wise County attorney Carl McAfee, who happened to be their family lawyer, they wrote a letter to Nikita Khrushchev. And in the letter, he said to Khrushchev, quote, from one old miner to another, which uh, Khrushchev had had uh, mining mm -hmm. connections. He had right. been a miner, too. And I think his family had also had other members that had been miners at one time or another in his family. He sent to the letter, and it said, from one old miner to another, please be fair to my boy and send him home. So in response, Khrushchev did answer it. Khrushchev did send a cable that read, if you wish to come to the Soviet Union to see your son, I am ready to help you in this matter. Now, some people would say that that was probably one of the craziest things that you could have possibly done is to try to reach out to a world leader. And, you know, truthfully, the federal government, the U.S. government, did not like that idea. They no, didn't like no. it at all. They felt like it should be handled strictly by diplomats, as the old saying goes, sort of a cowboy diplomacy, if you want to call it that. Oh. But uh, in turn, Oliver and Ida Powers, along with Carl McAfee, and I believe Dr. Lewis Ingram, yes. made the trip over to the Soviet Union, to Moscow, to this trial, and when everything happened, Carl McAfee was not allowed to be counsel to Francis Gary Powers because when you go to Russia, you might as well just forget about it. Then all bets were off the table. Yeah. There was nothing like what it would be in the United States. So McAfee was held pretty much to keep his mouth shut, and the family sat and watched the proceedings from high above. And I think what was considered to be like a – it was like an opera house, I believe, almost to a certain degree of how it was dressed up. It looked like an opera house. But Powers was convicted of espionage on August 17, 1960. Very quick trial, by the way, in Moscow. He was sentenced to 10 years, seven of it at hard labor at Vladimir Central Prison, 100 miles east of Moscow. Uh, he was allowed one hour with his family prior to all of this happening and him being sent on to the Vladimir Central Prison. Now, he didn't stay there for seven years, though, at hard labor no. or 10 years altogether. He was released just two years later. Powers was exchanged on February the 10th, 1962, along with American student Frederick Pryor for Rudolph Abel, who was caught and tried in jail for espionage in the U.S. That was done in Berlin at the Kleinecke Bridge, and that's a very famous bridge in movies because that's pretty much every spy exchange, that's where you see it. That's exactly right. I mean, that and then also the young uh, student, Checkpoint Charlie. Yes. That's yes. what's what is always mentioned. But now we have to mention too. Now we'd already mentioned about Bridge of Spies. This would not have happened if it had not been for the work of lawyer James B. Donovan. And Donovan was an insurance lawyer at that time. He worked for one of the most prominent insurance agencies as a lawyer for for many years, but he actually had to go and he went before I think the Supreme Court talking about this, all this with Rudolph Abel about Abel's uh, rights supposedly being violated of how things were handled. But he was sort of the catalyst to get this movement between the Soviets and the United States going in the first place in order to get powers home. You know, the United States government wanted powers back. They wanted powers back, but at what cost? Well, I don't think that Rudolf Abel was that important. Otherwise, no, I don't I, think, I don't he think was we'd either, have sent him so. back. So mm -hmm. there you go. Anyway, when uh, Gary Powers got released, he came back home. There was a huge reception at the Big Stone Gap National Guard Armory, where the VFW awarded Powers its citizenship medal. High school bands played, flags waved. Everybody was just so happy to see him come back. But this whole incident just about destroyed his life, Rod. Yes, it, yes, it did. His marriage fell apart. 
due to the two year separation from his wife uh they divorced it was always it was always kind of um i guess rumored or at least told in the movie with Lee Majors that they were having problems even back to the point when he was in Turkey and then also right before he uh, deployed and took off on Operation Overflight that he was being secretive about things. Well, when you're in the CIA and you don't know when you're flying out or you don't know when you're or what mission you're going to be on, Mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to be able to share that with a spouse. And that was the situation there. But the marriage fell apart. And then the Air Force went back on the promise to reinstate him without loss of time served in the CIA. It started cascading. And Steve, to me, this is one of the greatest travesties of what I call justice or at least the recognition of a hero out of this that could have possibly ever befell Francis Gary Powers. Yeah. Because Francis Gary Powers had to go and he couldn't tell his own story due to the incident remaining classified. Now, he testified on Capitol Hill in front of the Senate committees and he told them things, but there were things that he could not tell. These were things that he had sworn secrecy and sworn to you know, stay quiet about until, I guess, a statute of limitations or the limitation of time had kind of run out on this particular thing. Now, in the meantime, he went to work for the CIA, updating training, including Soviet interrogation techniques for captured Americans. But during that whole time, he was not allowed to fly. He went to work for Lockheed as an engineering test pilot, flying U-2s. And then he remarried a co-worker from the CIA, had a son, which is Francis Gary Powers Jr., which carries on a lot of things, I guess, about uh, informing us and keeping us knowledgeable about a time that it seems like a lot of Americans and a lot of people in the world have uh, made a tendency to forget, and that is the Cold War. He's been yeah. still trying to keep that at the forefront to let us know of how close we have been so many times to World War III and all these problems that kind of went along with the Cold War. That's right. He did write a book after all that became declassified, Mm -hmm. Operation Overflight, which is the basis for the movie that you were talking about with Lee Majors. When the book was released, though, he was let go by Lockheed because, well, the CIA had been paying his salary at Lockheed, and they didn't like the book. Yep. And so he lost the one job that he loved more than anything, and that's flying airplanes. Mm -hmm. And then he later on got a job flying a news helicopter for NBC affiliate in Los Angeles, KNBC, and he flew that helicopter, and he was actually covering along with a reporter for KNBC, I believe, some brush fires that was going on in the uh, Los Angeles, Southern California area, and developed trouble with his helicopter and was killed in a crash on August 1st, 1977, while covering a brush fire there, as I said, in the Los Angeles area. And here's another note for you, too. We've we've already talked about Operation Overflight, the book that came out in 1970, and you're probably familiar with Michael Betchloss. Yes, I am. Okay, Michael Betchloss, he is what is deemed as a presidential historian or a presidential advisor historian on NBC News. I had a chance to talk with Francis Gary Powers Jr. right about the time that he was making the big push for more people to know about his dad and also, I guess, and I won't say the word campaigning, but I guess doing more than anything else, trying to make everyone aware that his father had not received a lot of the uh, Medal of Honors and things like that, that some of these other uh, military people had you know, they'd gone through these different things, but Francis Gary Power Sr. had not ever received. And I had a chance to talk to him, and Michael Betchloss wrote a book, and it was a book about the uh, Francis Gary Power situation and Operation Overflight. Francis Gary Powers Jr. did not like the book. He did not really have a lot of good things to say in such a way about Michael Betchloss that uh, felt that it was fabricated. And that's the story of Francis Gary Powers, another story from Appalachia as part of the history of Appalachia. We appreciate you listening. If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast, you can do so by going to iTunes or to your favorite Android or Windows phone podcast app. We're also on Facebook. Please be sure to come by and like us on Facebook, and you can follow us on Twitter as well at Story Appalachia. That's it for this week. Till next episode, take care and we'll see you then. So long, everybody. 